Still alive? <laughs> Still alive? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the final torture for today. <laughs> okay. So let, let's continue. I just, I just uh, recover so the, right here the last formulas. We have our Hamiltonian. We have our inverse transformation, which now expresses atomic operators A in terms of these alpha operators, which are bosonic under the conditions that up squared minus dp squared is 1. Yeah? So now it's straightforward, lengthy but straightforward calculations. So if I to plug in this operator, I also write here for minus p, because here we have, have somewhere minus p. We have to plug it in here and collect similar terms. And the idea is under which condition we will not have alpha alpha and alpha dagger alpha dagger terms. Yeah? Because that's we start, we have in this one, and the idea to get rid of them. Yeah. So let's just be, uh, 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 let's just continue. So the first term, you cannot do anything. So now comes the sum over p, non-zero. And now we will have several terms. Ah, let me, for, uh, uh, let me call these things an epsilon p tilde. Yeah. So just otherwise make it shorter simply yeah this epsilon p plus gn okay so let me start with the first term what we will have epsilon p tilde and then i open the bracket so we have this ap dagger ap there here and let me now start collecting terms where we have alpha and alpha dagger yeah and this comes from the product of the first two so i will have up squared and i have alpha p dagger alpha p yeah, they are here. And then the, the, the second one with dagger and alpha and alpha dagger comes from here. It will have plus <coughs> Vp squared, yeah, because minus minus gives me plus. But now if you look, I will have the wrong order. I will have alpha minus p, alpha minus p dagger. So minus p is not a big deal because we sum over all p. This is depends on this depends on your model, so you can easily switch p to minus p. So uh, when it's necessary. That's it for the alpha and alpha dagger. Now comes the terms with uh, uh, both daggers and, and both without daggers. Let's now have a look at the, when you have both daggers, it comes from this and this. Yeah, so we'll have minus UPVP. And then we open the bracket because the, the, the alpha alpha terms will also contain UP and VP. Yeah? And also with a minus. So here now we have alpha p alpha minus p. We will have this one. Yeah, so we will have alpha, uh, this one first. Uh, no, wait a second. Uh, no, what am I right? Why? Oh, no, sorry, sorry. No, I'm, I'm here. S sorry, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah, I just want to be too fast. Yeah, we're, we're still here. This, this, and, and this one. No, I did it wrong, sorry. I did it wrong. So you have up squared, and then I will have alpha p dagger alpha minus p dagger. That's the only thing. And then I will have uh, alpha minus p alpha p, and that comes with plus vp squared. I don't yeah, that must be like this. Yeah, and, and then I will have alpha minus p, alpha p. Oh, what am I, s s sorry. We are still, ah, I forgot. <laughs> yes, so we are with this pair, we are still with this pair. Yes, so indeed, so we have like, initially was correct upvp and then we have this term we will have alpha p uh, dagger alpha minus p dagger and then we have this cross minus plus alpha minus p alpha p i think now i hope it's all correct uh, i think i should put it like this now I think it's correct, right? So now we come to this one, plus one half gn, 
let me also open the bracket now we have this term and that's again uh, it's these two and now first let's collect the term alpha dagger and alpha yeah and you see that here it's this part yeah so we will have minus up vp and then we will have um, alpha p dagger alpha p and then we will have this part uh, there we will have also minus vp up but now we will have uh, plus alpha minus p alpha p like this yeah okay now we comes in here where we collect terms dagger dagger yeah and without daggers and we took dagger dagger terms this has plus up squared that's exactly what i try yeah thank you so now it's this to this and then i will have here alpha p dagger alpha minus p dagger yes yeah so that one i guess is correct right this one now we have these two again so we will have here plus vp squared and we will have alpha minus p alpha p and the last one let's ch check it that's that's the last one there so we have uh, these two yeah and then this comes first let's now start with again with the with the dagger terms and then you see you always have u minus so minus u p v p it's these two terms so minus u p v p and now we will have um let's test this one alpha p dagger alpha p and now we will have uh another one is uh, so first this one then this and now we'll have plus alpha minus p alpha minus p dagger it's this one and now comes the term with the alpha dagger alpha dagger and alpha alpha um it's we again here yeah so with the alpha dagger alpha dagger terms is this ones yeah so we will have plus vp squared alpha p dagger alpha minus p dagger and i guess the the other part with with alphas is just plus up squared and then we will have alpha minus p alpha p so i think we okay let's see what comes out yeah so equals one half uh, g n squared over v then plus sum of p non-zero now again open the bracket let me first uh, collect um, okay these things right okay so what I can do is I write epsilon p tilde and then okay I think I, I, I should I should just continue up squared and then I will have alpha p dagger alpha p plus vp squared and then we have alpha minus p let me now uh, uh, switch p to minus p in this term right so I can write alpha p alpha p dagger so here I switch p to minus p which is not a big deal okay and then we have And then we will have two terms from here. They are the same, yeah? So it's minus two, two goes away. So therefore we will get minus GN UP VP. <coughs> and then we have this combination alpha P dagger, alpha minus P dagger plus alpha minus P alpha P. Okay? These are the terms L. What, what I got?
then let me also uh, remove here go to p to minus p in these parts yeah in these parts p to minus p so here we also have p to minus p and then we get these things It's this, these things we just collect, hopefully correctly. Okay, now we have a bad part. Here I forgot a plus sign. Yeah. Now comes plus. And now let's have a look. So you see what happens. So this part, so here if I sub add these two, yeah, because they have the same coefficient, one half gm, yeah, I would always get up squared plus vp squared for this term, and I get vp squared plus up squared, which is the same for this term, yeah? So therefore, I would always have this combination together, yeah? And this is nice, because this is Hermitian part. So now, what comes out, so here, let me write this coefficient. I will have in the first term, minus epsilon p up vp. That's from here. And from here, I get plus 1 half gn up squared plus vp squared and all multiplied with this uh, alpha p dagger alpha minus p dagger plus alpha minus p alpha p. And of course, you see already that in addition, if I choose in addition to this condition, I choose that this bracket is zero then I get rid of these anomalous terms. Then the only operators that I have are alpha and alpha dagger. Now let me just check uh, whether I get it correctly. Where is my bloody condition? Okay. Yes, no? looks like. So we have minus epsilon p u p v p plus one half g n u p squared plus v p squared has to be zero. That's the second conditions we have impose. And you see you have condition one and condition two for each p and you have two variables, u and, and v, yeah? So clearly we have, we can find the solution from this system, yeah? So therefore this term disappears. So now let me rewrite the rest in a bit more uh, elegant form and for this, I using this uh, from the uh, bosonic anti-commutation relation. Yeah, I use that this is one plus alpha p dagger alpha p. Yeah, because the commutator. So it's from the commutation canonical commutation relation. Yeah, and I just plug it in here for this term here and for this term there. And of course, first I have to collect the constant terms. So therefore, what I get is one half g n squared over v, and then I will have plus sum over p non zero, and here I will have um, epsilon p tilde v p squared. It's from here, and from 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 that one I get minus. G N U P V P. Yeah, this is a constant operating dependent part. And now comes the operator P non zero. And let me again combine the things. So I will get here epsilon P tilde from this term. I will get U P squared plus V P squared. And from the other one, I get a double minus 2 gn up vp. And now I will have alpha p dagger alpha p. So this is the result under these two conditions. We, we bring our uh, Hamiltonian in, in the form. Second. Yes. So we, we bring it to the diagonal form, yeah, equals E0. This is all this part. This was our E0. Plus sum over P non-zero of all this EP. 
and then alpha p dagger alpha p. So that is the our answer. Yeah. So let me write it over there and try not to erase because we will come back to these <coughs> quantities afterwards. So this is E0. It is 1 half G N squared over V plus sum over P non-zero. And then we have this epsilon P tilde V P squared minus G N U P V P. Okay, and E P was uh, this one. It is epsilon P tilde U P squared plus V P squared minus two G N U P V P. And of course, the two conditions that we have here, this one and this one. So now, of course, we have to go back to one and two together and find the solution for UP and VP. Of course, uh, it's, um, okay, in the end, it's, uh, you will formulate, you can put it to the right, make a square, and all depends on U squared and V squared. So, and then, so it's an algebraic exercise, which you can very easily do. The only thing that you have to be careful choosing the right root because you have u squared, so you have to choose either plus or minus. Yeah? But this is clear how to do, because when g goes to zero, you should reproduce a free particle case. Yeah? You should get for your ep, you should get p squared over 2m, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this you, you solve. So I give you the result. The result is like this. So u p squared is 1 half, then you have epsilon p tilde divided by ep plus 1. And vp tilde is 1 half epsilon p tilde over ep minus 1. You see we satisfy the condition up squared minus vp squared is 1. Yeah, because if I subtract the two, this disappears. And then you have half minus minus half, you get 1. And EP squared is epsilon P tilde squared minus GN squared. That would be the answer. Um, so let's have a look, yeah, especially for this one. Yeah, because we, we just want to see what is the result of the interaction. Yeah? So now I remind you this epsilon p tilde was epsilon p, which is p squared over 2m plus gn. Now squared minus gn squared. And now what we get is, of course, we get epsilon p. So it's the squares of the difference of squares. It's a difference times the sum. And the difference... GN term disappears, but in the sum it, of course, doubles. And now if I go back to EP, so it is, if I put all the numbers, all the expressions P squared over 2M, and then P squared over 2M plus 2GN. That's what I get. Yeah? And now if I take a root, I will get EP equals... Uh, let me write it in a, in a uh, so, so let me write here P, yeah, it's from here. And the rest I will write in the following way. They come square root. A GN over M, it's when I multiply, it's put it in here, plus P squared over 4M squared. And now you see, instead of P squared over 2M, for small P, you get a linear dependence. Yeah, so instead of single particle dispersion curve P squared over 2M, you get something which is typical for waves. Yeah, these phonons, these fluctuations, that kind of collective behavior, it's a kind of uh, a wave, a sound that you get in this liquid, of course, only because of the interaction. Yeah? Because if the interaction is zero, we here 
we completely recover p squared over 2m. Huh? So now if I plot this EP as a function of p, so clear in the beginning I have this, so here I will have epsilon p is just u times p, with u is square root of uh, g n over m, and then at a large momenta, I go, of course, to the quadratic behavior. And quadratic behavior, believe me, would be p squared over 2m plus gm. Yeah, of course, this would be dominating, yeah, but there would be some shift. Yeah. And the transition happens at some p star crossover. Yeah, it's not a transition, crossover. When the linear behavior goes into quadratic behavior, it's of course then both of these terms yeah, becomes the same. Yeah? They becomes comparable. When p squared smaller than this one, it's just linear. If p squared over 4m much larger than this one, you get the quadratic behavior. No? So in this, this corresponds to this p star squared over 4m should be of the order, m squared, sorry, of the order of g n over m. Yeah, forget about four. Yeah, so therefore we conclude that this p star is, I can define it like this, it is square root of g n m. This is where the crossover from this collective behavior like waves, sound, goes into the free particle behavior p squared over 2 m plus mean field. Huh? This sort of mean field we can add or just, yeah. Then, of course, what I want to, this, you know, P star, there must be some correspond. this is typical momentum, there must be corresponding length, right? We know. So therefore, there is always this psi, which is called the healing length, which I can define of, of the order of H bar over P star, yeah? This is called coherence length or healing length. Or coherence. So let us now estimate this quantity. So let me erase this one. So we just want to know how big or large compared to the interparticle separation. Yeah? So let me have a look. Okay, let me try here. Psi is of the order h bar over square root of g and m. Yeah, let me now remind you that our g was, let me now replace it, 4 pi h bar squared over m times the scattering length. Yeah, so if I plug it in there, I get, forget about all these fours and pi's, yeah, because I neglect here somewhere two, etc. So all the order would be h bar, and here we have square root of h bar squared n, m will cancels a, yeah? So h bar also disappears. And now we have this one over square root of n a. So let me now do the following thing. Um, it is uh, n to the power minus one third, which is the average uh, interparticle separation. And now in order to be, uh, what should I write here? I guess uh, n one third a. Yes, then I have one third minus one six. No, one third plus one six. Yeah, if I put a denominator, one third plus one six, it's exactly one half. Yeah. Okay. So then you see, or, or I can write it like this. Divided by uh, n a cube. Remember, yeah, our parameter, the number of particles in the volume with the size of the interaction radius. But now to the power, of course, one six. One six is a kind of not very good power. Yeah? But anyway, we can say if this is much smaller than one, yeah, even 
even power one six is much smaller than one. Yeah. So typically you would expect that these things is much larger than n minus one third. For here, n a cube much smaller than one. So it's actually big length. In a weak coupling regime, yeah, when the A becomes very small, this coherence length is large. So it covers many interparticle separation. And um, yeah, so, and this has a meaning, I won't show you this. So uh, it's actually, if you create some disturbance in the condensate wave function, I didn't discuss what it is, but I guess you get a feeling. So what's something in the gross Pitayevsky, et cetera. Then on this length condensate, this wave function goes to its uh, 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 uniform value, so equilibrium value. So it heals. So if you create a hole there on the scale xi, scale xi, it heals to its equilibrium value. That's why very often called healing length. Okay, so good. We now we see that adding a weak interaction, we very strongly modify the spectrum of excitations at low momenta. And of course, now I c you, you immediately tell me, well, let's now check the superfluidity criteria, right? So if we now check the superfluidity criteria using the branch, then we have the critical velocity, which is minimum over all P, EP divided by P. And it's clear for this spectrum, it equals to U. Yeah, to this velocity sound velocity. So that means any <laughs> flow with velocity below the sound velocity will follow forever. No excitations will be created because it's energetically unfavorable. So you will have superfluid flow, flow without friction. It won't slow down. Yes, so what we have superfluidity. Very nice. So you see, you need interaction. We ideal guess B, C, but so fragile, it cannot uh, have this superfluid flow. It immediately starts decaying. We introduce interaction, and we create some rigidity in the system. Yeah, and this leads us to the collective modes. Excitations now becomes collective modes here at low momenta. So here, that's still particles. Yeah? P squared over two m. This is just particle excitation. They're so high energy that they don't care about the interaction, about the rest. The only if it's mean field, yeah. But here we strongly modify and have the waves. Yeah? You can actually check that it's indeed this velocity is a, a thermodynamical wave. Yeah? Uh, because um, let me consider the, the dominant part in U. Uh, what was it? Sound velocity, sound velocity, let me call number C squared. What it is? It is 1 over M. And then you have uh, dp dn, yeah? So it's dp d rho, the mass density, or, or p is a pressure, yeah? And p pressure is minus de zero over volume, yeah? So let me take for E naught the dominant part, this one, one half g n squared of the volume. Yeah, so therefore, if I now calculate the pressure, P would be 1 half g n squared over v squared. That is 1 half g n squared. And if I now put it here, yeah, differentiate by, by, by the density. So I have C squared would be thermodynamical sound in this case would be just g n. That's my derivative divided by m. That's exactly what we get. Yeah. So it really looks like all equation for thermodynamics. But of course, yeah. yeah. OK, so let's now a bit take a more closer look on this uh, uh, state. Yeah. Let me now erase this. Oh, no, maybe not yet. I need to erase something. What should I erase? Let me erase this one. Yeah, you have it. Yeah, no. Okay. Now let me then erase. But this one you have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So now I have the new ground state. As I said, it is always defined that the state which, which do not, does not contain excitation. So that means alpha p on this ground state equals zero. At the moment, we don't know. Uh, I can write it in terms of apparatus, but uh, I won't use it. So for this purpose, we don't need it. For those who are interested, I can show you. But we, at the moment, we don't need it. So this is ground state. Define it like that. So let me now calculate the, the particle distribution. Not quasi-particles, because there is no o excitation. There is no excitation. So, but let me now calculate the following thing. AP dega AP. Assuming at the moment P non zero, huh? because we know that the big fraction is sitting in the condensate and zero, yeah, which we kind of define. So, but but this we know. Yeah, remember was in zero was n minus the sum over all these things. So let's now have a look distribution how the atoms with non-zero momentum are distributed here. Yeah. An ideal guess, there was no such particles. But now let's have a look. So now to evaluate this, I have to put here again expressions for this apparatus in terms of alpha. Yeah? And now I will have this one, up alpha p dagger minus vp uh, alpha minus p. That is my a dagger. And now I have a up alpha p minus vp alpha minus p dagger and the ground state. Now I can erase. Hey, hey. <laughs> so now uh, following this definition of the ground state, you see that here I have operator alpha acting on the ground state. And that gives me immediately 0. If I would be in a finer temperature, then I will have some thermally excited excitation that would be non-zero. But let's, we are looking at the ground state, t equals zero, as we all did before. So this term will disappear because alpha acts on the ground state and there is no excitations there. For the same reason, this term will disappear because this is equivalent to saying the G alpha p dagger is zero. It's the same. So if you create excitation, so this state should be orthogonal to the ground state, which does not contain excitation. Yeah? So therefore, we have the only one term here, and it's Vp squared, and then ground state, and here uh, alpha minus p, alpha minus p dagger. And now we do again the same trick. We just replace this using the canonical commutation relation as 1 plus alpha minus p dagger alpha minus p ground state. And then again, in this term, we see alpha acting on the ground state. This gives 0. So this term disappears because alpha acts on the ground state, and this is 0. So as a result, what we get, it is Vp squared. So this Vp coefficient squared gives you the atom or particle distribution in momentum space, huh? in momentum space. So now let's have a look at it more closely. So we have, therefore, we, ca we come to the conclusion NP non-zero is just Vp squared. Again, this is T0. Yeah? And if we want to write the full, OK, NP is N0 or N0. No, OK, afterwards. So let's have a look at this quantity. Yeah, this is the definition. Yeah, let me a bit massage it to in a more uh, convenient form for analysis. Let me first combine to these two terms together. So I will have epsilon p tilde minus e p divided by e p. Then I multiply it and divide by the sum e p tilde plus e p. So let me continue here. So I will have one half Ep times Ep p 
plus epsilon p <laughs> tilde. And here I will have epsilon p tilde squared minus e p squared. And now I would remind you this definition of e p squared. So if I put it in here, you see that epsilon p tilde canceled, and that's what I will have here simply g m squared. Yeah? So I will get that it equals to, um, so one half overall coefficient, and then I will have g m squared divided by uh, e p times epsilon p tilde plus e p. This is our actually momentum distribution for above condensate particles. And we can now make a, a analysis of this expression for small p and for large p. Yeah. Let's go first for p much smaller than p star. Yeah, remember p star, where our dispersion is linear, where we have Ep approximately u times p. So now if we look here, for this case np, non-zero would behave like one half gn squared. And here, you see, uh, uh, in this term, I will have u times p. <coughs> and here, in epsilon tilde, uh, let me just recover that you will have in front of you, epsilon p tilde is p squared over 2m plus gn. Yeah. In E p tilde, it goes to gn. Yeah. So here we will have this times gn. Yeah, because this is proportional to p, therefore small, so gn here dominates. One power goes away, so we have one half gn divided by u p. So you see it's one over p, so it's large. We know it. Yeah. So it's the as large, the same. So for small p, the, the, the occupation numbers becomes very, very large. We, we saw it already for the uh, ideal Bose gas, so it shouldn't surprise us. But it's an uh, integrable singularity, so there's no problem with that. Huh? So let's now take a limit, another limit, p much larger than p star. <coughs> and then, of course, we have Ep would be just p squared over 2m. Forget about gn, because it's anyway the dominant one. And then you see what you have here. You have here then np <coughs> non-zero would be one half gn squared. And here you will have, um, from here you get p squared over 2m. And from here you will get twice. Yeah, because from here and from here, so you get 2 times p squared over 2m. Yeah, and I guess all the 2 disappears. And then what you have is, what you have is mgn. So this is, remember this, and p standard divided by p over p to the fourth. So it decays, power-like, but it's also it's an integrable quantity. Huh? So if I make a plot here, yeah, you will see the following structure. NP, this is P. So here we have um, something like P star. This is zero. So here we will have singularity like one over R, and here it goes very quickly to zero. So here it's one over P, and here it is uh, one over P to the fourth. Yeah, but you have p squared or p squared dp. Because now I exactly want to calculate this integral with this. Yeah. So, uh, so this is this is how it behaves. Uh, <coughs> so now let me calculate the part of these particles. Remember, we define n zero like n minus sum over all p of these things. Yeah? So therefore, let me calculate what is called depletion. Yeah, this is 
depletion of the condensate. So remember, we have still to check that still most of the particles sit inside condensate and not kicked out in this depletion. Yeah. So what I have to do, I have to um, n prime would be sum over p this uh, n non-zero, yeah, and p. So I have to perform this integral, uh, and I guess, no, it's fine. I just need a bit more. So just volume, integral dp, 2 pi h bar cube, and then np. And as I said, at small momenta, OK, so it is volume. Then we have 4 pi, uh, this angle integral, 2 pi h bar cube, and then integral dp. Now you have p squared, and then you have np. Yeah? So you see at small momenta, it's just 1 over p, so we have integrable things dp times p, no problem there. At a large momentum, this behaves like 1 over p to the fourth. So the integral that you get at large moment is dp divided by <laughs> p squared, which is also convergent. And I won't bother you this with these calculations. I just give you the result. <laughs> uh, because calculations with all the square roots, etc., cetera, uh, they are a bit, um, well, not very pleasant. But if you somebody interested in the results, then I will can show them to you. So the answer for this is, of course, you have total number of particles, which is n times v, yeah, because here we have n's, etc. Yeah, and then you have the number is 8 over 3 square root of n a cube divided by pi. So it is n times small number. Yeah? So this number is small. So therefore, number in the condensate, which is n minus n prime, is indeed macroscopically large. n, 1 minus 8 over 3 square root of n a cube divided by pi. So it's of the order n. So indeed, our initial assumption was correct. If you have a weak interaction, it, of course, kicks some particles outside the condensate and form a depletion at zero temperature. There is no thermal excitation here. Form a depletion. But this part, these particles are belong to the ground state wave function. It's a part of the wave function. So it's not like a non-zero temperature in ideal gas. You have condensate. And you have thermally excited particles, they form, well, they, they are independent from each other, and you have to describe with the density matrix, etc. Here it is a pure state. This one, G. It's a pure state. So no density, well, density matrix can always write, but it, it's a pure state. And these particles, which are kicked out of the condensate, is a part of this wave function. So in, in, in all these. Uh, <laughs> theories, approaches to this Bose superfluid Bose system, people distinguish two things. Condensate fraction, it's N0, and superfluid fraction. Yeah? Condensate fraction is indeed this N0, but superfluid fraction, it's uh, the things that contribute in a superfluid flow at t equals 0, that's an entire density. It's only at finite temperature, you have thermally created excitations, which form a normal component. Normal component is a gas of excitations, which you create by temperature. Yeah? And the difference, what is left, therefore, in the, grounds, in the wave function is superfluid uh, fraction. So it's a superfluid density. In helium, for example, this is something around 10%. At zero temperature, this is something like only 10, somebody tells. 8, somebody said 12, 10, it's a good number, 10% 10 
sits in the k equals zero at t equals zero. But the superfluid component, its entire liquid is a superfluid component. There is no normal component in this case. So please don't be confused about the depletion and thermally excited exci excitation. These particles, these particles, are part of the wave function. It's a complicated wave function of the ground state. So it's a particle, you see it's a kind of distributed there according to this, but they all belong to the same wave function. So it's a pure state. Okay, and maybe what I want to tell you, right, good. Uh, okay, no, good, I have some time. Ah, yeah. Uh, before I go to the ground state energy, uh, let me look at the correlation. Yeah. Um, how does the superfluid fraction change if the interaction strength kind of changes? At t equals zero, at t equals zero, it all belongs to the superfluid fraction. At t equals zero, it all belongs to the superfluid fraction. Mm -hmm. This one, of course, depends on the interaction. The stronger, the less than zero. Yeah. So here, well give me Na cube and you from here immediately can calculate what is the percentage of particles. In helium it's 10%. Yeah. So helium is not at all weak in weakly interacting gas. So therefore there it's indeed only 10% according to the measurements and Newton scattering. Yeah, they say 10% sit with K equals zero. The rest is just distribute something with K. Yeah. Um, Okay, let me, let me now uh, tell you something about correlation uh, in, in, the, in the gas. <coughs> Just to compare with what we have for the ideal gas. So let me now calculate the correlation function here. Or oh, again, the density matrix, yeah. C1 uh, minus uh, 2 yeah, was this now with this new ground state. Remember we have psi dagger R2, psi R1. That's the same story. Yeah. So now if you do uh, similar calculations, uh, so uh, again you end up uh, with the same uh, similar equation because this ground state does not, it has total zero momentum. Yeah, there was some discussions <laughs> after the lecture. So then, then it would be sum over P because in Psi we have our atomic apparatus A, yeah? So what you end up would be sum of, of these things and then you have these um, E to the I over H bar P and then you have R1 minus R2 and then you have average now over new ground state of A P dagger A P. Yeah. And I guess one of the volume in front. Yeah. Similar expressions that we get. So but now ground state is not a condensate of with thermally excited atoms, but it's a, a ground state of our uh, Bose system. So of course there is a P equals zero, which is a special case always, yeah. So we'll have N0 divided by volume, N0 is there, plus sum over P non-zero, E to the I over H bar P, let me call it again R, yeah, like what we had before in the ideal Bose gas. But then you have this, and this is exactly what I calculated here. Yeah, this is VP squared. And for this VP squared, I forget you erase the expression. So it's N zero over V. And then what was it? Um, okay, sum over, P. okay. And now I, I perform the integration, of course. Yeah. Replace with the integral, sorry, one of the volume. And now plus the integral DP over two pi H bar cube. And what was it? Um, G n squared divided by E p and then epsilon p tilde plus E p. <coughs> I think it was something like that. And a factor of two.
<coughs> okay, this is M0. This is again long range order. We, and then the exponent, sorry. We suspect that this integral for la, r goes to very large value should decay, and it will. So, but this remains. And this is again this off diagonal long range order that we have for the ideal gas. Yeah. But now we have, and then again for r goes to infinity, of course the small p are relevant. So let me integrate over angle this cube. And then I have gn squared over 2. Yeah, that is this one. And now I have integral dp. Ah, uh, no, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't, sorry. Because otherwise it would be, would be a bit inconvenient. No, no, I shouldn't. Let me write it like this. dp 2 pi h bar cube. And because r goes to infinity, the things that is relevant here is a small momentum. Yeah? And small momentum here comes, so again, so here uh, we just have gn, and here uh, the exponent is there. And here we will have this u2, a uh, 2 I, I took out. This one is up, and this one is the dominant one. This is just p, forget it, small p, and this is uh, gn, yeah? gn. So this is our distribution at small momenta, right? Uh, so power of gn goes away. And now what we have? N0 plus 1 half gn. And then we have divided by u. And now the integral is like this. dp over 2 pi h bar cube e to the i over h bar pr divided by modulus p. So who can tell me what is this integral? We all go around the same integral. Yeah? So before we had Fourier component of the Coulomb, yeah, which was one over k squared, and we go to the, but now we go back yeah, with the redefinition. Yeah? Because one over p is a Coulomb in momentum space, and now we do Fourier transform to the coordinate space. Yeah? So it gives me, uh, well, this remains plus one half g n over u, and I guess I have to put here h bar, and then I get four pi over big R squared. <coughs> um, I can put here g u in a form of uh, the square root of g n over m. Yeah, so, but I wouldn't do it because it doesn't make much difference here. Yeah, so you see, indeed, you have a long range order. So when R goes to infinity, it goes to N0. Yeah, the condensate fraction. And, uh, but it be decays a bit faster than a yield was a guess at T0. There we have one over R, here we have one over R squared. Yeah, but anyway, we have this off diagonal long range order. And, but fortunately now we have superfluidity because the, uh, the spectrum modified in such a way that the critical velocity is non-zero. And final things which I want to discuss for bosonic systems is the ground state energy because I will use some things there which should introduce you some things which I will need also for fermions. Um, So let me now go back to that, the, the first one, the first one, and calculate the ground state energy. Of course, if we know the energy of the ground state, we know chemical potential, okay, the dominant contribution we can calculate already from here, yeah? D naught dn, that would be gn, yeah? It's already positive compared to the ideal Bose gas where it always has to be negative or zero in the BEC regime. So here will be positive. That's not a surprise. So let me look at this expression. E0 is uh, uh, 
should I probably divide by volume? Okay, now let's skip it at the moment. One half uh, g n squared over v plus the sum over p non-zero. So I have a little bit um, walk on this expression. So uh, now the first term is epsilon p tilde, and then uh, u p squared. Yeah, a v p, uh, v p, v p squared, v p squared. Yeah, and a v p squared. I, I combine them. Yeah as I did. Yeah? So I write it um, epsilon p tilde minus ep divided by 2 ep. Yeah? That is the first term, this one. And now minus uh, 2 gn. And if I calculate, now I want to calculate upvp. Let me, let me show you how I do it in here. So if I take u p squared times v p squared, I just have to multiply these things yeah, together. Uh, so what I will get, I will get one fourth. Here I will get e p squared. Yeah, in both expressions I come to the common denominator. And then I will have the product e p tilde plus e p. And here I will have e p tilde minus e p. Yeah, so what I will get here. I will get e p tilde squared minus e p squared. And if I now use this definition of my e p squared, so then you see it is so one fourth and that's g n squared. That was the only thing that is left is this one. Very simple expression. Yeah? So you take a square root and you get one half g n divided by e p. So therefore I put here one half g n divided by EP. Let's just check that all coefficients are there. Okay, so let me now combine. Somehow I'm not. Mm, just a second. Wait a second. Why? 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 Yes, the factor of two should not be there. Why I put it? I don't know. I look to some. I oh know. I look here. I look in here. Sorry. No, without two. Right. Right. I look to the wrong formula. G N V P U P V P was in both. Yes. So now uh, let me combine. 1 half g n squared over v plus sum over p non-zero. I have 2 e p in both terms in the denominator. And now here I will have e p tilde squared minus e p tilde e p. Yeah, that I use this bracket. Minus from here comes g n squared. Yeah? And now I combine these things and these things that gives me big EP <coughs> squared. Yeah? So what I get here, one half G N squared over V sum plus sum over non-zero P. And then I will have E P squared minus E P epsilon P tilde divided by two E P. And now clear one power of, of EP goes away. And we have a very simple result. Let me let me write minus and then uh, just reverse. Yeah, that's it. Epsilon p tilde minus e p. That's a very simple intermediate formula. Yeah? I just minus here, 2 is from here, minus because I reverse the order. Yeah? And now finally what I do before I start analyzing, I again multiply and divide by the sum. Yeah? So uh, therefore what I will get, 1 half g n squared over v, minus one half sum over p non zero. So
So here I will have a sum, epsilon tilde P plus EP, and here I will have epsilon P tilde minus EP tilde squared minus EP tilde squared, and this again I know what it is, is GN squared, yeah? So at the end, I get for the energy of the ground state, let me write a separate formula. E0 is just one half g n squared over v minus one half g n squared sum over p non-zero one over epsilon p tilde plus e p. So this sum I have to calculate. But then if you look at it, you immediately see that it has a problem. Yeah? For p equals zero, there is no problem in denominator because this one goes to constant value gn. Yeah? But for large momenta, we have a problem because this quantity for large momenta, how did it behave? So here I have p squared over 2m, the dominant contribution, forget gn, and this one is also p squared over 2m. So in total, it behaves like m over p squared. And this is bad <coughs> because the integral over all momenta diverges. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so what can I do? And this is exactly what is called renormalization. And that's exactly the place where you cannot replace g with 4 pi h bar squared over m times a. Because here, you see, we go to second order, and this nice substitution, which was derived for the Born approximation, yeah, is a pseudo potential, yeah, which are used to design to be used only in the first order. So here we take it to second order because of g squared, and this is not valid. Yeah? So, but for this purpose, let me do the following thing, and then I explain you why it is good. Yeah? Yeah. So let me add and subtract this term in here. Yeah, so I understand you are tired. I do the following things. Yeah. And I split it. Uh, subtract I re uh, re uh, remains here. Then, of course, I subtract the dominant term. The next one will be 1 over p to the fourth. It will be convergent one. That's fine. But now I have this one. And this comes, uh, let me write it like this. Um, let me write it 1 half g n squared over v, then I have minus one half uh, uh, g n squared sum over p non-zero m over p squared, but still I have to interpret these things, minus one half g n squared times the sum p non-zero and here you have uh, 1 over epsilon p tilde plus ep minus m over p squared. So this thing converges. So what should I do with this one? Um, let me do the following. Let me take out 1 half volume and n squared, yeah, because here n of the volume, I divide by multiply by volume. So it's, it's uh, no, so, sorry. Okay. And here, therefore, what I will get is the following g from here minus g squared divided by vo one of the volume sum over p non-zero m over p squared. This is this one. So now I will argue that this quantity, what I have here, it's a uh, 4 pi h bar squared over m times scattering amplitude if you calculate it to second order in the Born expansion. The reason for this, you see, the first indication when it should be something like this, and I'll write some formulas. 
you see, this divergence comes at a very large momentum. Very large momentum means the particles come very close to each other. And if they're very close to each other, they don't care whether they're just two particles alone <coughs> or two particles in a many body system. It's just a two particle problems that becomes important when P becomes very large. So distances becomes very small. So therefore, these things has something to do with the Schrodinger equation or the collision of two particles. And I will show you so it's exactly what, what, what's going on. Okay, now I don't need it anymore. <coughs> so um, in the scattering theory, uh, in a very sophisticated scattering theory, people introduce what is called off-shell scattering amplitude. Who actually has a very good course in scattering theory? Jörg will give it next week. Who will have a very good course in scattering theory? Meaning that you have integral equation for scattering. Do you have it? Who knows what is integral equation for scattering? Okay. Part of it, I guess, Jörg will explain you, but uh, in a very sophisticated scattering theory, people introduce this off-shell scattering amplitude. <coughs> it's a, a quantity that formally it depends on energy and two momenta. Or maybe it should p prime p. I think it's better. This is p and minus p incoming particles, p prime and minus p prime outgoing particles, and e some energy. Why off shell? Off shell means, well, it's a two particles, yeah, so therefore the double energy, yeah? So that means p squared over m, yeah, that's the total kinetic energy of colliding initial particles, p and minus p, so twice p squared over 2m, not equal to p prime squared over m, yeah? So particles, energy is not conserved during the collisions in this quantity, and this is all not equal to the energy. It's a very strange object. How it is defined? It is defined through the integral equation of that type, gamma e p prime p equals, now comes the Fourier component of your interaction, p prime minus p plus, and now comes the integral over q, some intermediate momentum for scattering. Then you have v tilde of p prime minus q. Then comes one over e minus q squared over m plus i zero. This is a magic, tells you how you should go around the pole to get the outgoing waves for the scattering. Yeah? Those who had this integral equation for scattering, they know this trick. And then comes gamma e q p. So this is integral equation that determines this thing. So why it is so nice? Well, first of all, it, it, it contains all the information. Uh, it's not only scattering amplitude. It contains information about the bound states, et cetera, et cetera. Because parameter E here, very often you will find it here, Z, instead of E, just not to be confused with the physical energy. Just spectral parameter. So if it's negative it ca in the poles, it have a bound state. So these things contains all information about the physics in this potential scattering and the bound states, everything, yeah? And uh, how it is related to normal, what we learn in the scattering theory, is that I, this is off shell. If I put it on shell, this very scientific word means that now I'm conserving the energy. Yeah? So the energy E is indeed the energy of the incoming particles. 
and I have elastic collision, so therefore it's the same energy of the outgoing particles, then this gamma is exactly 4 pi h bar squared over m, that's normalization, times your scattering amplitude, p prime p. So this is normal scattering amplitude which you define when you solve these radial equations, finding, uh, finding the, the scattering phase shifts, etc. that you will have a lot next week. Yeah. So this is exactly scattering amplitude. And now you know, of course, if I put e to zero, and of course modulus also goes to zero, so this f goes to the scattering length. That's the only thing what is left. So this is 4 pi h bar squared over m times a, the scattering length. So, uh, yeah. And if you uh, want to be more... Uh, um, okay. <laughs> Just few drawings, yeah, just for you a bit <laughs> relaxed from formulas. Yeah. So the scattering, it's, it's uh, diagrammatically, it looks like this. Yeah, so you have, uh, let me write now from left to right. This is this block gamma, two particles comes, P minus P, two particles goes out, P prime and, 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 and minus P prime. Yeah. But how you can represent it? Yeah. Remember our interaction Hamiltonian in the second quantization. Yeah? The first term is just this one that we already have in our Hamiltonian. Yeah? Just scattering with V tilde. So we have P, P prime, so here minus, and here V on P prime minus P. Yeah, that's our first term. But then, of course, these two particles can scatter again and again and again. So in total, this block <coughs> describes for you all such processes so this is a second order. Then there is a third order. I don't write all the all the arguments, etc. So there are some rules how to identify with these plots, with the nice pictures, with some analytical expressions. So, but what you do to get this e equation, so let's now select this term, it's exactly this one, yeah, and then in all the rest we just cut from here. And then you recognize that on the right hand side of this cut is exactly the same series as you have here. Yeah? So therefore all these infinite series I can write in the form of my potential. plus these things so here gives some q and this is gamma and this is v tilde so it's diagrammatic summation of this series it ends up in this equation yeah? and if you just forget about this so, so you see you can use this now iter iteratively yeah expand gamma in powers of V. The leading term is just V tilde. And if you look carefully to my definitions, how gamma related to the scattering amplitude, then you'll recognize, so if you keep just this term, you get a Born approximation for the F. Yeah, you get <laughs> F equals M over four pi H bar squared times the Fourier component. This is Born approximation for your scattering amplitude. If you take more terms, you get higher order terms corrections to the Born approximation. So just the second one would be what you just replace gamma here with the V tilde, etc. So in principle, iteratively, by iteration, you can get whatever order you want. The question is, of course, to calculate these integrals because if some realistic Fourier component, you cannot. Yeah? But now let's use these things within our approximation for the potential. Yeah? Because we derive this Hamiltonian, 
by replacing the true potential with the contact one. Yeah. So let's now do the same for this thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we again have a problem with the space. So first of all, uh, let me to the second order for the BCS we will need the full series. So please remember this. I will use it also for fermions at some point to the second order in V tilde equals just G. Yeah. So uh, therefore to the second order this has to be replaced with V tilde. Yeah, this is second order. Yeah, and now let me put E to zero. We know if I put E to zero and put this on shell, so I get for my gamma, second order would be just 4 pi h bar squared over m times a yeah, scattering amplitude and on the right hand side I get expression the first term gives me g plus this is g this is g so I will get g squared and then I get integral dq over 2 pi h bar cube and now we have minus m over q squared. So let me put here minus here. And if you replace p with q with p, it's exactly what you have here if you replace sum over p with the integral over p. Yeah, you see, it's exactly the same expression that you get here. Yeah? So, of course, I have to be a bit more careful. I should say, well, my model for the interaction acts only for the momenta, which are typically one of a size of the potential. Otherwise, I have to take really the momentum dependence of the interaction into account. Yeah, so here I will have to cut my sum roughly on this one over R0, yeah, which R0 is the size. But I uh, have to say the same what's here. Yeah? So, f so to make, the, the, the make some sense of the formally divergent integrals, but you see it's exactly the same structure that you get. Exactly the same. So what finally you can conclude yeah, from all these hand-waving arguments that if you calculate the energy of the ground state energy yeah, of the Bose gas, this weakly interacting Bose gas, what you get is, um, let me write it here, you get uh, one half v n squared <laughs> times. Now this sum is exactly this, four pi h bar squared over m times a plus or minus one half g n squared. Or I can now put the volume also away and then I have my, so let me take volume out divided by volume and now we have integral dp over 2 pi h bar cube of this bracket. So now everything is finite. And I can calculate this, the integral, and I hope I can quickly find the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this term, you see, it is um, 2 pi, 2 pi h bar squared divided by m a uh, n squared. Yes, this is this one. And if you calculate the second integral and ex extract the same quantity, then you get 1 plus 128 over 15. So this number should, you see, 
It, they, they, this such number doesn't come for free. Yeah, you have to really work hard. Yes, square root n a cube divided by pi. It's the same parameter that will determine you the depletion. Yeah? So this is the answer. This is the answer for the ground state energy of the ideal Bose gas. So we can now calculate, of course, with this, we know everything. We can calculate pressure. We can calculate chemical potential, etc. cetera. No? So and the chemical potential mu, yeah, which is d is 0, OK, over volume. Uh, divided by dn, yeah, and that's of course, yeah, of, yeah. So what you get was would be uh, this, uh, um, because it's two, so you get four pi h bar squared over m a, one plus, and if I find, I will write you. Otherwise, uh, I do I have it? I must have it somewhere, maybe. No, 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 I cannot find so quickly. Cannot find so quickly. Okay, so you get something there. No, I cannot find, but we can, I'm also tied to, to differentiate it. Uh, so you'll get some. Uh, The number would be different, but here would be, so let me see, it's n squared. So it's uh, n and 1 half. It gives me 5 over 2. Yeah, so I differentiate. I should get 5 over 2, and I guess 4. Yeah, so I, I don't want, I don't want now to do it. Huh? But you see, this term is just gn. If you put for the G, this is our Born approximation. Yeah? So you see, important things that it's positive, contrary to the zero or negative chemical potential for the ideal Bose gas. And that's, of course, not a surprise, yeah? because we have repulsive gas. We can put the lowest energy of our system below the lowest energy of our bath because chemical potential means you have exchange of particles. Because in this case, we have a repulsive gas. It's a repulsive interaction that stabilizes the finite density in your system. Without repulsion, the energy in this case, the density in this case would be infinite, but the repulsion stabilizes yeah, such that you have now positive chemical potential. And I guess, let give me just a few seconds, maybe I still find it. Maybe I still find it. Yes, I found it. Found it. Yes. Yes. So I guess I stop at the moment the lecture because I guess I there is much more to say about this Bose system but uh, uh, it's it's anyways need two lectures for the fermions so next time we start fermions the only comment I want to tell you remember in the ideal Bose gas we are able to calculate actually the properties in all temperature range yeah at zero temperature at large temperature close to TC yeah we didn't do it but in principle we can analyze what kind of behavior you have, specific heat, for example, energy, or whatever you like, uh, as a function of temperature. So here, we cannot go to, to TC. Yeah? Because I remind you, our model simplification of our Hamiltonian was uh, built on the fact that N0 is very large. Yeah? And of course, that was how we select the term in the Hamiltonian and end up with a quadratic Hamiltonian which, which we can diagonalize. Close to TC, of course, N0 is not small, so therefore you have to deal with the whole Hamiltonian with the quartic terms, and this is impossible in, in actually to do. 
So that's why there is no good theories except for Monte Carlo numerical calculations for the uh, 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 transition region. Yeah? <coughs> we cannot calculate, let's say, specific heat because we know in experiment in helium it's lambda point where specific heat diverges. It looks like a Greek lambda yeah, at Tc. So nobody can calculate these things analytically. Yeah. You can open the book of Feynman statistical mechanics because Feynman spent a lot of time trying to build some theory for this helium. It, it's actually very nice. You see how the mind of the genius works. Yeah. So what kind of arguments, what kind of construction he used. And here <laughs> there were some fine, funny comments. So it's a good exercise. I leave it for as an exercise to analyze this behavior close to TC. If you solve it, you can publish. <laughs> so it's still open, <laughs> still open. I think I finished now. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> yes, please, one. <laughs> yes. Actually, uh, I was wondering if we suppress, uh, so, so this is for uh, contact interactions. If we suppress the contact inter interaction, but we still have some kind of uh, short range or long range interactions, do we have the same properties like in regard to superfluidity? Do we st can we still have those? Uh, in principle, in principle, yes. The only thing that you don't want to have uh, uh, as a as an attractive part. Uh, the 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 picture, the typical example here is a dipole gas. Yeah, mm. if you have polarized dipoles, then of course you have a bit of a problem without contact interaction, yeah? Because dipole interaction in, in this direction is attract each other yes. and in this direction repel. So if you naively put in here, what you will get, um, um, so uh, what do we have? We have this uh, uh, the expression was like this. There was this P and what we have here was GN over M plus this P uh, squared over 4m squared, I guess was something like this. Yeah? If you have a dipole interaction, then you add to this one, you will have gn over m plus dipole-dipole interaction Fourier component. And this Fourier component, if I remember correctly, dipole-dipole at p, it's of course anisotropic. Yeah? So it has some constant, 4 pi over 3 dipole squared, it's at this uh, S gas units, or some 4 pi epsilon 0, or mu 0, or 4 pi, depending. And then you have um, this sort of behavior. Uh, I think it's 3 cosinus squared theta minus 1, where cosinus theta is the angle between the polarization of dipoles and the momentum P. This is theta. And now you see that in plane, when theta 0, you have minus. So therefore, you have this minus something comes from a dipole. And people really see that if you start decreasing this one by Feshbach resonance, if it starts slower than, smaller than this one, you have instability. You have instability, they see it, you can form of droplets and things like this. So it's a very interesting physics behind. Yeah? But in principle, if you don't take into account high order terms in the energy, yeah, which, which actually this one's, yeah? This is Li Huyang Yang corrections called these things, yeah? They have a higher power in density. Yeah, if you look at the energy, they have corrections density to the power of five over two, yeah, compared to the mean field N squared, yeah? They stabilize the system in the end, but it becomes kind of more complicated physics. If you have just one of a cube or something like this, this will drastically change the results yeah, compared to contact, because contact is a model for short range interaction. Mm. Because somehow with this trick, which was here and we erase it, with all these arguments, you can actually replace the short range interaction or whatever interaction you have uh, through the scattering length. So they won't change much. Mm. Mm, some people still alive. <laughs> no, I just use the definition. I just use the definition. So, 
for ideal gas. Yeah, this is your bath of particles, yeah, which you, and this is your energy, and this is zero, yeah. This is typically what we assume for the bath. Yeah, let me put zero here. And now you have a system. Uh, in ideal gas, you cannot put the lower energy, which is minus mu. This is minus mu below this. Yeah, because otherwise, if you put it below, nothing prevents infinitely many particles coming here. Yeah. They all come to the zero energy and come and come and come and come. So you must have mu negative to put it up. And then, of course, here you will have some thermal distribution. And then you populate some part. If you have repulsive case, there is no problem. So this was ideal case. In the repulsive case, there is no problem to put it down because particles starts coming in, but they repel each other. And this repulsion stabilizes the density. You cannot have here infinitely many particles because it will cost you uh, infinitely infinite energy. Yeah? You see, this, this term stabilizes you the density, final density. So therefore, in the repulsive case, there is no problem. If you have G negative, then of course you have a problem. Yeah? We have a collapse, yeah? and it's clear why we use positive G, because then you can say my epsilon P becomes imaginary, so you have dynamical instabilities, etc., etc., which is against the case, you have a collapse. But for the repulsive gas, this is no problem. That's why mu becomes positive. 